Okay, we are live. Uh, thank you all for joining. We'll get started soon. Nancy will give them um, one more minute. Sure, no problem. Okay, let's get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sugatri Koluru, Director of the Trailblazers Initiative at the DSCI, and I'll be your host. For today's session, we have Nancy McGuire, Vice President, Global Procurement Services and General Procurement Sourcing at IBM. In her 25 years of career, Nancy has taken active leadership roles in various divisions of supply chains. And today, she's going to tell us about her impressive career and share some important insights from her supply chain leadership. Nancy, thank you so much for joining. Sure, happy to be here. And before we begin, a couple of points. Uh, duration of the session is 30 minutes, so we will have 5 to 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. Uh, we will have a chat activated on the Zoom, so please type your questions or comment on anything you find interesting during the course of the session. Um, with that, let's get started. So Nancy, uh, thank you for your time um, once again. Um, so you've, be, you've managed and worked in every nook of the supply chain and currently serve as the Vice President of the Procurement Services at RPM. Can you give us an overview of your professional journey? Sure. Uh, I started um, with through an industrial engineering degree at Ohio State University. So um, through my uh, college time, I interned or co-opt, which is what we actually called it, with General Motors. So I was in the manufacturing you know, supply chain part of the world through college. And then when I came into IBM, I was supporting manufacturing. And I came in as a process engineer but in a few years, I went into management and I went into managing procurement engineering. I managed supply demand planning. I managed fulfillment. I managed direct procurement. I manage now indirect procurement. So pretty much the only thing that I never had direct management responsibility for in the supply chain was logistics. But for sure in a role like I've had in all those aspects, uh, I've had plenty of opportunity to expedite and, and work with my logistics colleagues, but I've never had that specific role uh, across the across the supply chain. Thank you. I mean, you, you, you've basically been all rounder, I should say. Yes. Uh, as, you, as you look back and reflect on all the work, supply chain work, especially you've done in the past 25 years, what has been the most favorite part, if you can pick one and why? Well, they're, they're all, they've all been different. And some of the jobs you take, you take because you kind of need to, to get that stripe. You need to learn that part of the supply chain. So some of those jobs maybe were not quite as fun, but you had to do them. I would say though, that the experience that I had that has been the most rewarding or most, most fun was about four years ago, uh, the chief procurement officer at IBM asked me to lead a team to implement Agile agile techniques and agile practices into the procurement process. And many of you on the phone may know agile is typically uh, uh, steps that are used in software development. And IBM made a decision to bring it into operations, which means into mm -hmm. supply, uh, uh, supply chain procurement uh, specifically. So I led that for the procurement team and it was awesome. Um, it was so cool for three reasons. One, it was the first time we'd ever done something like that. So there was a lot of creativity that we had to, to apply to something that we knew very well. Um, two, I had an incredible team that I was able to put together to, to make this happen. 
And then thirdly, this was one time where I designed something and then I was the recipient of it, right? I actually led one of the teams after we implemented Agile so that I could, um, you know, course correct and fix things uh, that worked uh, well or didn't work well. So um, that was probably the most meaningful thing I've, I've done, you know, really in my nearly 30 years. Um, just to build off on that. So is there something from your previous work experience, you know, from your early stages of your career, which helped you uh, build this agile experience, or, you know, or, or work on this agile project for the first for the first time? I think, yes, I think that uh, understanding that um, what we do in supply chain is end to end and, mm -hmm. and having experience in several parts of the supply chain. So when you go to do agile, and what agile is, is you, know, you basically are having a team take responsibility for everything um, to, 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 for speed, it's all about speed. Um, so for sure, those experiences helped inform the way we thought about the redesign. And, and again, the team that I had together, they, they brought in all sorts of experiences that I didn't even necessarily have. It was a global team. So they were bringing in global perspectives that I wouldn't necessarily know. So yeah, that combination of years of experience and, and global reach, I think really helped with our design. That's interesting to know. Um, so now let's maybe talk about the challenges, um, you know, in all your years of uh, working, uh, supply chain experience. Um, I mean, no supply chain leader has been an exception. You must have faced substantial challenges in 2020 and as a result of the pandemic. Can you share some of these challenges and personally as well as, you know, with respect to in terms of, uh, you know, IBM supply chain and the actions you took to overcome them? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And uh, one of the benefits of my experience is I've been through a few, what I would say, you know, were just huge alterations in, in the way things were happening, right? So um, we had the dot-com bust in the early 2000s coupled with 9-11 event, right? Which just changed the, everything for, for a period of time in the, in the terms of the way transportation, uh, product was moved, et cetera. And then you went to the end of the 2000s, 2008 and 2009, when the economy, the US economy broke, right? Uh, which had global implications. Many of, and then we, you had tsunamis. We had um, some really significant earthquakes out of Japan that had serious uh, supply chain disruptions. So a lot of um, our processes have been developed as a result of those events uh, that really had us well prepared for what happened with when the pandemic struck. So things like um, you know supply chain risk. We were really good at supply chain risk, but. What the pandemic did was show us we needed to, to be even better. So we had to go further and further into our tier one, tier two, tier three uh, supply base for supply continuity. Um, some other things like supplier financial risk assessments, very good at that, but we really had to increase the frequency and we had to expand how far we went because in a global pandemic where everybody is affected, now you've got supply chain vulnerabilities that could be popping up all over the place. So I, I would say that our pre preparation and learnings from those prior events really enabled us to deal better with the pandemic than maybe you know a, a, a less experienced organization um, might face. The other really big thing that that we did, which I would say was unusual compared to other events, we had a huge human element to this. So the, the practices that, that leadership employed, right? We, we literally as leaders in IBM um, signed commitments, made pledges about how we were going to lead in a work from home environment. So within two weeks of the pandemic being announced, 95% of our employees were working remote and they were working remote with environments that none of us really could get our heads around, right? They might have three generations of family living in the household. They might have kids at home, you know, taking school at the same time that they weren't doing classes. These poor parents are trying to, you know, deal with business continuity issues while making sure their kids are getting their, their homework done, right? Unprecedented. We've never dealt with that before. So the human element was really amazing. And this pledge that we had, and we, we used, a, you know, an online social um, tool to do this, but the pledge was about 10 different elements that basically said, hey, we're going to do this during this environment. We're going to be empathetic. We're going to be 
mindful. We're going to be kind. We're going to be compassionate, right? And which is such a funny thing to say out loud that we had to do that, but it really did shift your mindset to say, this is different. This is not business as usual. People are dealing with unprecedented, you know, human uh, situation. And what's interesting is it's happening now again to us just in spades. We have a very large organization in India. Uh, I, I mean, that's topical, right? The, the, the challenges in India are just skyrocketing. So again, that pledge and, and that recognition about understanding people are trying to work, they're trying to juggle their homes, they might have somebody sick in the house, they might be sick themselves, sick right? Yeah. Um, that whole pledge was a new element. I think that's something we had not had to deal with in prior you know, I'll call them crises. Uh, thank you. I mean, those are very good points uh, you raised, Nancy. I think uh, what we keep hearing and you emphasized is the importance of uh, having the long-term strategic view, especially around balancing suppliers and the leadership, you know, uh, practices which emphasize the human element. Mm -hmm. I think that came out loud and clear. Yes, I think everyone, myself included, um, have evolved an emotional quotient that we didn't necessarily have a year ago. Uh, every sure. meeting starts with a conversation about the human stuff before you get into the business stuff. Um, we used to talk that way, but you know now we're really doing it right. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think there's been some real blessings from this from this whole um, you know shift to um, working within a pandemic and working remote. For sure. All right. So let's move to the next question. And I should call it the question of the order of my favorite question. Uh, supply chain has historically been a male-centered environment. It's slowly changing. Do you believe um, that is still the case, especially in your environment, or is it changing? What advice do you have for organizations uh, to address this gap and promote women leadership in supply chains? Yeah, I, I, I knew you were going to ask me about this. So I went and you know looked at some data before we uh, got on the phone today, just so that I could ground myself um, on supply chain, right? And just some um, data points that I found is it, it appears uh, that it's roughly a 40-60 mix now, 40% mm -hmm. women, 60% men that are in supply chain types of roles. I would, I don't have the data, but I would speculate that that is that is an improvement over when I started years ago. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much of an improvement it is, but we're getting close to that 50-50 uh, mix, which you would expect given you know, global demographics. Um, the management, however, is still only around 20%. And so that means our, the leadership in supply chain still hasn't kept up with you know, the, the female uh, balance, right? And, and so why is that? What's going on with leadership? And you all know on the phone when you have leaders that are um, representative, uh, representing your organization, you have a better chance of, of being a successful organization. So I would say, you know, this is something that um, we look at really closely. I, I can tell you that within our organization, we're about a 50-50 mix. And um, this is a procurement statement, by the way, not a supply. I don't have the supply chain data for IBM, but procurement. Um, and we are very intentional. I guess that would be my first piece of advice is you need to be intentional about this. And when I say intentional, that means you understand your data, right? So what, look at your data, what does it tell you? Um, and some, some of the data that you might wanna collect is, you know, representation. What, what is female representation? What is female representation in the different levels within your organization? A lot of companies will see, you know, really heavy penetration at the entry point um, but then it tapers off as you get higher and higher up the, um, the food chain. So why is that? Go underneath that data to see what things you can find out. So that, that's the first thing in terms of being intentional is, is get the data that can help inform you. It can also help you when you take actions to look back to see, are those actions having an impact? So for, I'll give you an, an example. Uh, we had a challenge um, where we saw, all of a sudden one year we saw a bunch of attrition occur um, out of whack from our normal attrition, right? And we get exit interviews and those types of things. So we went underneath it, like what is going on? Why are we having all this attrition? And we, and we, we had the data, then we had round tables, we had interventions to talk to people, we had those exit interviews, and we took actions resulting from that 
And sure enough, you know, we, we've seen a, um, a stabilization of that attrition back to normal rates. Our next intentional thing is to really look in that pipeline and see how are we actually moving and progressing with ratios that are equivalent as you get higher and higher up in the leadership ranks. Because, you know, going back to my data, why do we have 40% women in the workplace, but only 20% in management, right? So that, that doesn't make sense. So um, there's something going on underneath it and you wanna get under the data and then make um, intentional actions around that. For sure, uh, very good points. I think being intentional and what's more interesting is about the data point you raise. Uh, you know, data is very crucial, especially in supply chain, right? You know, managing your demand or managing your suppliers. But now from what you said, it's, it's even important, especially for managing your talent. When you're seeing like, you know, having a lot of uh, women in the entry level positions and why are they not going up the ladder? What is happening in between? Are there not enough incentives or is it, are the other fields more attractive? So I think the importance of expressing that the supply chain has changed over the past few years, it's no more the men's only club, you know, how it's evolved, it's, it's become more interesting. I think it, it's important for the organizations to bring that up and say it out loud and clear so that it, it's, it's attractive and stays as a viable option for, you know, for, for the, you know, talent. What do you I, think? I agree. And, you know, when you think about getting underneath that data and understanding what's happening, why there's fallout as you go higher and higher up uh, the ranks, you know, programs like mentorships and sponsorship, those are critical. So women can have someone to talk to and learn from about how they navigate, you know, what happens when you move from one level to the next, right? Um, this focus on retention. What happens uh, in the middle when you know women have babies, uh, and you know yeah. they have to take the time that goes with that? A, a lot of companies have recognized now how important it is to to give a healthy amount of time off, give meaningful reentry back into the workplace, um, allow for all the things that women have to do when you have a newborn, right? Um, you want to nurse, you want to be able to you know do those types of things. A lot of companies, IBM being one have really um, gotten clever about how to make it much more manageable for women to, to, to um, have families as well as, as work, which is a huge change uh, to you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's, it's amazing what, um, the com what, what corporations have done. Couldn't agree more. Um, maybe let's shift gears here and talk about personal strategies. You've touched upon it slightly. So what was your approach uh, to self-development and building leadership skills, which, which enabled you to have a successful career at IBM? And what advice do you have for the women and the audience who've joined us today to succeed in the supply chain journey? Yeah, I, I, um, I would go with uh, three things right off, right off the top, and I know there'd be more, but let's just, let's just talk about three of them. The first one is curiosity. Um, you have to have an interest in understanding how your role fits in, how your role fits into the next role and understanding, of, uh, you want to kind of understand things all the time. And that curiosity for me extended to, I was always asking people what their job was, how they got that job, you know, what, how they grew in their career, what kind of roadblocks or things I should watch out. So that curiosity really started to help me when I would talk to other people about, you know, future roles. The second advice I would say to you is take the hard jobs and do them really well. So if you, if you want to advance in your um, supply chain uh, career, you really do have to do some of the hard stuff and some of the jobs are ugly and they may not always be fun, um, but they, they teach you and they help develop you. Sometimes it's something that you're uncomfortable with or something that's risky. Um, but you usually uh, learn something pretty important through those types of roles. So I would say take the hard roles and do them really well. And then finally, just recognize that development is just a, it's a continuum. It never stops. I, I'll give you an example of one for me. I'm, I've been in leadership you know, for, for years and years and years. Every day I get a, um, a, a, a feed into my inbox of a bunch of leadership articles that were published the day, day before, eight, eight articles, let's say. And I, I look at the titles and I can guarantee I read one a day. Um, it's wow. just not because I'm thinking, oh, I have to do this. I'm interested in it. 
and I know I need it for me to continue to be a good leader. And research and advice around leadership is changing, right? So mm-hmm. I, I need to recognize that I need to change and I need to grow. So so lead. So I would say, you know, recognize that development is a continuum. You're never done. Um, and then if you keep that sort of as a mindset, I think you're, you'll grow naturally in your in your um, in your supply chain career. Great tips, Nancy. Um, again, I think um, just a continuation to the self-development part. Uh, you mentioned about network and mentorship uh, slightly, uh, you know, in, in our earlier uh, chat. Uh, so has mentorship played an important role in your career? How early in your career were you, you know, did you have your mentor? And if yes, what have you learned about yourself along the way? Yeah, mentorship, sponsorship absolutely critical in my career. Um, I work in a huge company for one thing. So just having mentors who can help you navigate um, the maze, right, is, is huge. I would say it was very early on. And again, I mentioned that I'm a very curious person. So I, I would just, you know, strike up conversations with people and to understand things about their background and, and their career tra- trajectory. People love to talk about themselves, right? And so they would share, and, and sometimes there were natural affinities that grew as a result of that mentorship or, or mentorships that, uh, that were created through that. Others were more, were, you know, some, maybe a, a higher level executive saw work that I did and reached out and, and really kind of pulled me in Um, And that was super helpful. They really became more like sponsors of me to say, Mm -hmm. you know, Nancy, this is a job I think you should go do. Um, And they would sort of sponsor me into that role. I would tell you in hindsight, um, I didn't take, I wish I, I wish I would have listened to them more and been more risky about some things. I think I would have moved quicker in some areas. I held myself back because I was afraid or I didn't trust enough about how they could see things, right? And it's interesting, I I talk to my kids about it now and say, you know, you really should listen. They they, kind of know a little bit more (laughs) than you do. Um, So that's the one regret is I I, I do wish I would have taken more risk based on based on the recommendation that I had from some of my mentors. That's awesome. And there is a very important reason why I asked this question, Nancy, because we kept hearing from all our guests that how how important of a role mentorship and network has played in the career. And that is for, for, for the very same reason uh, at DSCI, uh, we are launching 21 for 21. It's a mentorship program. And if I may, I want to just quickly talk to our audience a little bit about that program. Sure. Uh, so it's a free mentorship program for women who are in the early stages of the career. And through a four month program, we teach them the idea is to teach them important elements to enable a digital supply chain mindset and also assign them a senior executive, just like Nancy, uh, to be their mentor. Um, I think uh, we want, I think you touched upon it, uh, we believe this having less women in supply chain is more of a pipeline issue and not just a cultural or a diversity issue. Mm-hmm. And through the program like this, like 2021, we believe that it is more of a sustainable long-term strategy for building diverse and high-performing teams. So yes, uh, to all my audience, it's a great networking and learning opportunity. You've heard from Nancy how important a mentorship or a mentor can play in your, uh, a role of a mentor can be in your career. Applications are open. So we have most of, uh, we have most of the past speakers join us as mentors. So please check our website for more details and submit your applications. Um, Nancy, I think with that, let's move to the Q&A. Um, uh, so uh, audience, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Meanwhile, I'll take the questions which I've received from the registration form. Um, so Nancy, the first question for you is, what is the key difference between supply chain leadership and leadership in other business units? Um, it, that's a great question. I think that um, there is a mindset that goes in supply chain leadership, uh, which is largely operational. Uh, supply chain people, I think you mentioned it, right? We, we are all about numbers. We are all about um, execution. Uh, you know, it's, it's a mindset of operations and that kind of rises to the top. It's also about innovation. Uh, because we're always having to transform and make whatever we're doing better. So those two things, I think, really rise to the top in terms of the leadership 
um, characteristics in supply chain. Whereas perhaps if you go into, let's say research, the leadership in research, the attribute of um, operations isn't as high up, right? They're, they're much more creative. They're doing things just to do them, you know, to break, break and find new things. So operations is not as critical in, let's say research. So my answer is, I do think the attributes of leadership shift in terms of prioritization, depending on which organization that you're in. And then if you're in supply chain operations and innovation really rise to the top. Thank you. And we have one more question, uh, which says, how did you discover your career passion? How important was family support during your career? Oh man, that second part, huge. <laughs> um, so the, the first part, I, you know, I, I kind of stumbled into procurement and, and that type of thing. I, I, I was an industrial engineer, you know, that's what I studied and I knew I was going to be in the industry, but I didn't really know where my career was going to grow. So I, I'll be honest, it, it kind of it kind of evolved. It wasn't like I sat down and said, ooh, I really want to be a vice president of procurement one day. Um, I didn't know that. Um, so, so let me just say that I did know that I wanted to aspire to uh, a higher level leadership role. So I, I knew that, but I didn't really know where that role was going to land. And that sort of evolved over time. With respect to family support, um, absolutely 100%. Uh, I have three kids. Um, my husband is a professional also. Um, supporting me in my professional environment, that is, that is a family thing. Uh, it's especially a, um, a, a, a parent thing. Both my husband and I uh, spend a lot of time making sure we, we can balance the things that we have to balance. A lot of the, we have a, a bit of a non-traditional household. He does the cooking. Uh, that's not necessarily true in a lot of households. We, I mean, he does the grocery shopping too. That doesn't fall on me. Um, but there are a lot of other things that I do. Um, so, you know, we balance it. And um, when I have decisions about taking, when I took a director role or a VP role, we had a very serious discussion about how, you know, demands in the household would change and how we would do that. So absolutely a family um, uh, support thing to, to make my, my job successful. That's wonderful to hear. Um, next question. Uh, we say, how did you manage your team's morale during the pandemic? I think it's likely just upon the pledge, uh, the IBM pledge, but I think the question is more uh, focused on how you personally manage your team and get their morale high. Yeah, you know, this was, this was uh, just wild, right? We had both, we had both the pandemic um, where we were all figuring out how to stay engaged. Now, agile practices are brilliant for this because I don't know if you guys know agile, but you have daily standups or weekly standups. So you're always getting together as a team. And so we were just doing that on, on WebEx versus, you know, in a conference room together. So, so the keeping in touch part was good, but then we had the social unrest of the summer in the U S right. We had, you know, the, the George Floyd killing and then all of that unrest and all that sort of recognition that, wow, our teams are under incredible stress. So we really need to talk. And that really became, we got a, a lot of great help from our human resources team about how to have conversations, um, you know, stopping talking about business and shifting gears towards talking about personal stuff. Um, so that's really how we've done it. It's been, and, and you almost have to shift some of your practices that you have in the, in the face-to-face world, like, round tables or, or that type of thing. And you got to start having them on WebEx and you have to start teaching people how to do that on WebEx uh, or on Zoom. So um, it's really using a lot of the old techniques but applying them with the technology that um, is available to us today. Thank you. We'll take one last question, uh, which is live. I think I'll rephrase this a little bit. Uh, what has been uh, the biggest failure in your career, if you consider anything and what are the lessons you learned from it? The biggest failure, did you say? Yes. Oh, um, uh, that's the easy one. So I, um, I went, I think, and I, I shared this with you. I actually tried to go out on my own in 2008 to start a consulting company. Uh, I left IBM and I went out on my own and um, the, the economy crashed. I, I left in April and the economy crashed in August. And I spent the next two years trying to sell um, consulting services in an environment where no one was buying anything. 
So um, I learned so much during that two years. I don't regret it one bit, um, but it, it was not successful, right? And I, I went back into corporate America and I, I took all the things that I learned during that two years. I actually think it made me a better uh, corporate um, citizen than I was when I left. Um, so again, no regret about it, but it was, it was, um, it was a crazy time. It was a hard time. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And with that, I think uh, we came, we have come to the end of the conversation. Uh, I should say, I really enjoyed uh, this 30 minutes with you, Nancy. It's, it's been an amazing 30 minutes and I'm sure our audience are feeling the same as well. So thank you very much for your time as well as thank you for your willingness to volunteer as a 21 for 21 mentor. Uh, you didn't have to do it, but you decided to do it. So I think that speaks volumes about your commitment to support uh, women leadership. So with that, I would say thank you everyone for joining. Stay safe. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.